So hello everyone and welcome to Fun with Categories. I'm Marco Perone. I work for an awesome company called Statebox where we do a lot of tools based on category theory. And so I would like today to present you one of them, which is a library we built, which deals with categories. So let's start from the very basic. So what is category theory? I'm not going to uh, repeat the definition. You probably know it and you heard a lot of talks about category theory today. But I just want to mention that category theory is a kind of field of mathematics that deals principally with composition and compositionality, so we all love them in functional programming. But still, even among a mathematician, often category theory is known as some abstract nonsense. And looking around, I found this nice quote, which says that category theory is indeed general abstract nonsense, and that it is precisely because of that that it is so important both mathematically and philosophically. So. Uh, what I get from this quote is that category theory is such a general tool that we have in our hands to speak in a precise way of really a lot of things. So we can speak of composition, of compositional behavior using categorical terms, and then we can apply uh, the result that we have there in many, many uh, practical uh, fields, practical domains. So, for example, just to remind you of some, we can apply category theory to databases, as in particular to data migrations. We can apply it to dynamical system, to game theory, to machine learning, to, yeah, that was linguistics. This is machine learning, manufacturing, probability theory, and the theory of processes, meaning concurrent and distributed computation. That's mainly what we are doing at Statebox. And if you want more, we are building up a GitHub repository with a lot of resources uh, about how you uh, can apply category theory to real-world problems. So uh, if you want to use category theory uh, in all these domains, uh, what you want to do is not only use functional programming, which you love, which actually uses terms and concepts from, function, uh, from category theory, but you actually want to use category theory to model your domain. So you want to talk about categories, functors, natural transformation when you talk about your domain. And if you actually want to do that practically, uh, you need to have some kind of a library in your code base which deals with all these concepts. So that's exactly what we decided to do when we uh, started coding up this thing, Statebox, and we created this library which is called Idris CT. It's completely open source, so you can check it out on GitHub. And when we started thinking uh, about it, there were two main characteristics that we wanted to get from this library. So first, it, needed to be, it needs to be practically usable because what we want to do with it is to run some software. We, are, we don't want just to take an icebook of category theory and play a bit with Idris or Agda or some other nice languages and see what comes out of it. Uh, but still, uh, we wanted everything to be formally verified. And with this, I mean, uh, in mathematics, you usually prove things to be sure that they actually hold. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to port those proofs uh, in our code and actually have the compiler check them. So, uh, so to be even more sure than mathematician than what we are doing actually works. So we decided to do this uh, using Idris. Uh, because we thought this was the best language which addressed the two points I just mentioned. Uh, Idris, uh, for the ones who do not know it, is a general purpose, pure functional programming language with dependent types. So the thing that distinguishes it from Haskell, for example, is that it has dependent types. So let me remind you what are dependent types. So for example, uh, when you do functional programming, when you do Haskell particularly, uh, you think about functions as a first order concept. So you say that 
You can take a function, assign it to a variable, pass it to another function, return it from a function. You basically treat a function as any other value you have in your language. Well, when you do uh, uh, work with dependent types, you do the same with types. So you can assign types to variables, you can pass types to functions, you can return types uh, from functions. So you treat types and values in the same way. There's not really uh, defined boundaries between what is a type and what is a value. So the interesting thing that you can get with using dependent types uh, is that you have the ability to encode proposition, to encode proofs in a pretty natural way in your language. For example, if I wanted to say uh, that a natural number m is n is less or equal than a natural number m, I could use this data structure that you can see here, and then I can pass this proof of this fact around in my program so that, for example, whenever I want to subtract n from m, I know that it, I will get uh, still a natural number, so not a negative one. And the nice thing, I think, uh, about the tendon types is that since you could do this, uh, they allow us to write things in a more natural way. So let's see what I mean with an example. So you can consider the head function you have in Haskell, which just takes a list of elements of type A and return an element of type A, except for the fact that if you give it the empty list, it crashes. And this is due to the fact that this, in fact, is not a mathematical function. So if you think about it, a, a function in mathematics is something that for any element of the domain returns one element of the codomain. And this is not the case because we have no way to map the empty list to something in the codomain. So uh, we have two solutions to this problem, so to make this actual, uh, actually a mathematical function. One solution is the one uh, we probably all know, is just let's add one element to the codomain and map the empty list there. So in this way, we recover uh, this as a mathematical function, and then we can do some nice stuff. We maybe as a monad, and we can do all the tricks uh, we know. But I would argue this is not the most natural way to proceed to make had uh, a function in a mathematical sense. So uh, what they teach us in school when we do mathematics is not to add elements to the codomain, usually when a function is not defined everywhere, but is to restrict the domain. So that's actually what we would like to do to make things more natural. And we can do this saying, OK, well, the function is the fight for every list which is actually known empty. Uh, and this works fine, not in Haskell. It works in Idris. Why? Because that is not empty L. That L is actually a value which is brought up at the type level in the type there. That's why they are calling dependent types, because the type is not empty L, depends on the value L. Uh, so uh, maybe I convinced you that this is kind of a more natural way to do things. And what I'd like to do now is to use this kind of machinery to implement some category theory definitions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some live coding uh, with Idris2, which is some software which is still in a pre-alpha state. So live coding, pre-alpha software, what could go wrong? Well, let's see. Uh, so let's start uh, with the definition of a category. I'm going to go briefly through it, because probably you all have an idea of what a category is. So uh, first, I would like you uh, to think uh, uh, to a category in, in this way, because uh, a category is a very abstract concept. But I think that it helps uh, if you have a mental model when you think about a category. And the mental model, I think, is very nice to use when you think about a category, is to think of a category as a context for some kind of information, for some, some knowledge. And so the first constituent element of a category are objects. Objects uh, in the abstract are just 
dots in a space are just things, a collection of things. Uh, but we can interpret that with our model as pieces of inform information, as chunks of knowledge. So let's go down here and let's start implementing. Yeah, it works. Uh, what a category is. So we are going to say that a category is a record. Uh, this needs a constructor, which we're going to call make category. And then a record just has a bunch of fields, so we need an object field because we're going to have a collection of objects. And this will have type type. Whenever you see type, think set collection. So object is just a collection of things. Uh, so let me check if this compiles. It does, so let's go on. Uh, what do we have next? So beyond uh, objects, we have morphisms, uh, which are just arrows between dots. Uh, if we interpret that in our mental model, uh, if objects are pieces of information, uh, well, uh, morphisms are connections between information, so they are kind of a way to go from one information to another one. So, how can we encode this in our definition of a category. So mm, a morphism is just defined by its source, by its target. And once we define the source of the target for the morphism, we get a collection of morphism. So this means uh, to describe all the morphisms, we just take uh, a source and a target, and we get a collection of morphisms going between these two objects. All right. So these are the basic elements of a category. Now we want to add some dynamics to it. Basically, we want to have an operation which acts on morphism, which is composition. Composition just tells us whenever you have two consecutive morphisms, you can get a third morphism going from the source of the first to the target of the second. If you think about our mental model, this means, well, as soon as I have uh, a way to connect some information, in a way that the middle information coincide, I have a way just to skip going through that and go directly from my source f to the target. And this needs to happen for any pair of consecutive morphisms in my category. So let's go down here and implement what composition is. So we said that for any objects A, B, and C, and any pair, oh, I don't need this. Whenever I have a morphism from A to B, and I have a morphism from B to C, I need to be able to retrieve a morphism from A to C. OK, compiles, good. And the remaining element we need to define a category are actually some morphism which are always there, which are the identity morphisms. So for any object in our category, we will always have a morphism going from that object to itself. And yeah, identities may seem like trivial, but I want you to, if you want, to try to think in our mental model, what does it mean to have the composition of two morphisms to being equal to an identity morphism? So now, if we go down here, we can implement the identity. So we said that for any A object in our category, we need to be able to retrieve a morphism which goes from A to A. And yeah, let's see. OK. Up to this point, I could have done the same thing in Haskell, you could think. Yeah. Uh, but. Actually, this is not a complete definition of a category. If you take a category theory book, it does not stop here. Because we want to have also some coherence conditions among the, the, the operations and the morphisms we have. Uh, namely, we want the fact that composition plays nice uh, with the identities. So whenever we go through an identity and then we compose with another morphism, when we compose, we get the other morphism, and the same thing if we compose on the other side. So first we go through a morphism, then the identity, their composition, 
is the first morphism. So these laws are called uh, left and right identity. So let's go down here and implement them. So left identity says that for any A and B object of our category, and F morphism going between A and B, it always needs to be true that the composition of the identity with F, so first we do the identity, then we do F, needs to be equal to F, and the same thing on the other side. So we have the right identity, which still takes two objects, A and B, and a morphism F from A to B, and it returns a proof that the composition of F with the identity is actually equal to F. Okay, not done yet. We need to go back up here for the last law of a category, which is associativity. So, uh, composition gives us a way to compose two morphisms, but once we can compose two, we can compose many. But what happens when we try to compose three consecutive morphisms? Well, we actually have uh, a priori two ways of doing this computation. So first, we could try to compose the first two and then compose with the third, or we can first compose the second and the third morphism and then pre-compose with the first. So a priori, we will get two parallel morphisms going from the uh, source of our path to the target of our path, but actually associativity is telling us that these two things must always be equal. So. Uh, in some sense, uh, we don't care about where we put parentheses when we do uh, composition of morphisms. And so let's go down here and say that composition means that for any A, B, C, and D objects in our category, F morphism between A and B, oops, G morphism between B and C, and H morphism between C and D, we will always need the following thing to hold. So the composition of F with the composition of G and H must be equal to the composition of the composition of F and G, and then H. So far, so good. Uh, we have a complete definition of a category in our library, but it may be not working, maybe it's not usable. So uh, I'd like to show you that this actually works pretty fine. And I'm going to implement one category, which is the category of Idris types and function. So I'm going to say that Idris card is make category, and then I need to give, uh, as I define my category, I need to give, say, what are the objects, what are the morphisms, what's composition, what's the identity, uh, and I need to prove that left identity, right identity, and associativity actually hold in this category. So we said that we want the category of Idris types and functions, so the objects are just going to be all Idris types. So type is fine there. Morphisms are just going to be function between types. I need to define, uh, let's say, a helper type over here. So our objects are type, and the signature of morphism was object to object to type. So in our particular case, this becomes type to type to type. And the definition for any two types A and B, I want the morphism between them to be the functions between A and B. And I'm going to put them over here. OK, there's a typo, but I'm not going to correct it. Uh, and so now we need to provide also composition. We need to say what identities are. We need to say what to prove 
the left identity, the right identity, and associativity. But we actually want to take this a bit slower and relax a bit and just ask for some help because who knows, maybe we don't know far away what we need to plug into the uh, composition. So what we can do is we could ask some help uh, to the compiler because already the compiler knows quite a lot about what these things could be. These are type holes and I can ask the compiler, for example, what is comp? Uh, all right. All right, I guess I need to reload. Line 19, thank you. Uh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So. Okay, we compile again, thank you. Uh, so, back here, we could ask the compiler what he knows about comp. So it's telling us that comp is a function, we take the arguments, a function from A to B, and a function from B to C, and it's to return a function from A to C. This kind of looks pretty similar to the function composition we already have in Idris, but actually, uh, because we define things in a particular way, the arguments are flipped. So I need just to flip the arguments and just use the standard function composition, but just flipped. Uh, for the identities, well, they're just gonna be function from a type to itself, which do nothing. They're gonna just gonna be uh, identity functions. And what about the left identities? Mm, oh, right. So, okay. So left identity is asking us to prove that the function which to any x assigns f of x is actually equal to the function f itself. But we are in luck because this is obvious for the Idris compiler, so it already knows that this is true. So we have a thing, uh, which uh, we have an equality where the left hand side and the right hand side are actually equal. So the proof is just going to be well, use the reflexivity of uh, the equality. So we are just going to say that writing REFL here, we stand for reflexivity, and the right identity is going to be exactly the same. And right, so let's take a look at associativity. And associativity is asking us to prove that the function which to any x returns h of g of f of x is equal to the function that to any x returns h of g of f of x. But these are, are really the same things. So also in this case, we are in luck and we can plug a raffle here and we can compile, we have no more type holes, so this is our first uh, complete definition of a category, and it wasn't that hard, I hope. Uh, and I hope you're seeing how this is quite natural uh, to write and to read. So uh, now, coming back here, uh, usually when we want to model things using categories, is not enough to uh, use just one single category. What you probably want to do is just to consider more categories uh, in our mental model, more context of information, and possibly uh, bring some uh, information from one context to the other context and back. Uh, so the, the right tool to do this mapping between categories is just called the functor. So you probably familiar with it in Haskell, Scala, or other functional languages. Uh, what's a functor? Well, it's just a way of mapping between categories in such a way that we preserve 
the structure uh, which exists in a category. Uh, so I'm going to do the same. I'm going to walk uh, through the, the definition of a functor and implement it. So uh, the first thing we need to do to define a functor is just uh, define a mapping between the objects, which are the basic elements uh, of a category. So for any element of our starting category, we need to assign uh, an object of our target category. So let's go down here and let's start. So we need a record. It's going to functor. This is going to be indexed by its source and target categories. It needs to have a constructor. It's going to be make functor. And the first field is, as we said, a map between the objects. So for any object of the first category, we need to be able to assign an object in the second category. So let me check. Everything's fine. So then, that's not enough to define a functor. What we need also is to define a mapping between morphisms. So for any morphism, let's say from A to B uh, to in our source category, uh, we need to map it to a morphism in our target category. Uh, in such a way that we respect the mapping on the objects. So how we're going to do this, so we're going to define a map more, and we're going to say for any A and B objects in the first category, I need to have a mapping between the morphisms in the first category between objects A and B, and morphisms in the second category, and I need to respect the mapping on objects, so I need to go from map obs of A to map obs of B. Okay. And these are the components you usually see of the definition of a functor. Uh, well, if you think about Haskell or Scala, usually map opt is just your data constructor of the functor, and map more is your F map. But this is, again, not a complete definition of a functor. We need also to preserve the structure uh, of a category. So we need to preserve identities, and we need to preserve composition. So uh, since we can, uh, we are going to code this. Uh, so preserve the identities. So for any object A in our category, we want that whenever we map the identity, which goes from A to A, and this is the identity in the first category on the object A, we always need to get the identity in the second category on the object, which is uh, the result of applying the functor uh, on the object level on the object A. All right, this A is an object in the first category. I need to tell it that. Okay. And now we will want also to encode the fact that our functor mapping will preserve the composition. So this means that the mapping of the composition will be equal to the composition of the mapping. So preserve comp will be something like for any A, B, and C objects in the first category and F morphism from A to B, and G morphism from B to C. We want to have them when we map with our functor, the morphism going from A to C, which is the composition going among objects A, B, and C of 
f and g, this is actually equal to the composition, oh, I need to say that this is in the first category, composition in the second category, and now I need to specify some things which shouldn't be there, but since I'm working with pre-alpha software, well, I need to wait uh, a new release, actually. Uh, but at the moment, this needs to be there, otherwise it doesn't compile. So the mapping of the composition needs to be equal to the composition of the mappings. So here I need to have map more between A and B of the morphism F, and the other one needs to be map more between objects B and C of morphism G. All right. Something's not right. Uh, let me see if I can catch that uh, fast. Otherwise, I'm going to go on. So I'm not going to solve this now. I'm sorry for this. Uh, if I was a better developer, probably I could have got this working live in stage, but if you do this correct, it works, I assure you. So let's go back here and what we're going to do now. So to go into a more risky territory, now I'm going to do a demo. Uh, because uh, what we did up to now was just to define some categorical things and you could see it may be fun, but it's still not very usable, but I would like to show you that it actually is, so you can actually use category theory to run software uh, in a nice way. So let me walk you first through what I'm going to show you. So uh, start considering a directed graph, like, for example, the one that I'm showing you here. It has three vertices and three arrows. And it's not so hard whenever you have a directed graph to construct a category from it. So you just, to, you just consider the paths uh, on the graph itself. So what you will get, you will have all the empty paths, which will work as the identity morphisms. And you will have, whenever you have a loop, you know that you can go through it n times. Uh, composition will just be concatenation of paths, the object will be the vertices. And so this is kind of uh, not so hard to understand category. And so, uh, well, we have a category, we can build a category out of this. So we already defined the category of either its types and function. So what we may like to do is just stick a functor between those two categories to map information between one category to the other. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And so mm, to define a functor out of such a category, uh, what you need to do is just you need to do what it does on object, which are the vertices of our graph. and. I'm going to map it to into the category Idris types and functions. So the vertices are going to be mapped to Idris types. And since I want to interpret this graph as a, some kind of uh, e-commerce flow, I'm going to say the first vertex will just be uh, the unit type where you have no state to track. The middle vertex is just going to be uh, a cart. So you will just have a list of cart items, which are made by a product ID and a quantity. And the final vertex uh, will just be a checked out state, purchase completed, where you will have an invoice ID. And this is uh, the definition of the functor on the object level. We need to define also on the morphism level. And since this is uh, a nice category, to define uh, a functor on morphism, it's actually enough to define uh, how the functor behaves on single arrows. And then everything else is uh, done by the fact that the functor preserved uh, the composition. 
So uh, we want to map our first arrow to some login functionality. We want to add our loop up there to something which actually interacts with the user and adds the product to the cart. And then we want to check out, uh, which are going to say, OK, you completed your purchase. You will get an invoice. And after this, we can choose a path, because a path is a morphism in our starting category. And so once we have chosen a path, we have a morphism in our starting category, we can use our functor to map to our target category. So we take this morphism and we interpret it in the category of Idris types and function. So what we're going to get is just a function in Idris. So that's actually something we could execute because it's a function in a programming language. And to execute it, we just need to give it an initial value. So we give a value to the function, and we are able to compute it. So let's go down here. And here, I'm going to walk you briefly to the code, which does exactly what I just told you. So this is the same picture of the graph I was showing you before. Here you have the definition of the graph. So here you have your three vertices. It's the e-commerce state data type, which has three possibilities, guest, cart, and purchase completed. And here you have the three arrows, one going from guest to cart, one going from cart to cart, and one going from cart to purchase completed. Then I need to define the types I need. So I'm going to say that initial state is just the unit type, which has actually no, 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 no content. A product ID will just be a, a sum type between four units, meaning we have four products in our e-commerce. We have a choice between four things. The quantity is going to be a natural number. Uh, a cart item is just going to be a product, think a tuple, a record of a product ID and a quantity. And the cart content is going to be just a list of cart items. And to end, our invoice ID is going to be just a natural number. So now we have all the types, and this allows us to define the mapping uh, at the object level. We need also some functions going between these types. Uh, to define the functor on the morphism level. So we need to define some functions. So we have the login function, which just takes a unit and creates an empty cart. We have the add product function. We just take the, the current cart content, interacts with the user, asking it to provide a product ID, providing uh, a quantity, and it will update the cart accordingly, adding that product to the cart. And then we have a checkout function, which just generates a random invoice number and spits it out. Now, as we saw before in, in the slides, we need to, to define a path. So this is just a way of encoding the path I showed you before. So you first go in through the, the first arrow. You do twice the loop, which is this there here. And then you go uh, through the, the last arrow, which is this there, there, here. And finally, we put all of this together. And we use this compute function that is defined in some library. And we pass to it the definition of the graph. Uh, the definition of our functor. So this is saying, OK, the first vertex go to initial state, the second to our content, the third to invoice ID. This defines the functor on the morphism level. So the first arrow goes to login, the second goes to add product, the third goes to checkout. Then we pass to it the path and the initial value. Oops, not there. So if we go here. We can compile this code. This is Idris 1, so it's a bit slower, but we can still wait for it to do its job. OK, everything is fine. 
and then we can execute it. So remember, we need to log in, add two products to the cart, and then check out. So it's going to ask me the product ID, the quantity, another product ID, another quantity, and then it's generating an invoice number, and it is returning. And yeah, this is what it does. Going back here, I'd like now to recap a bit what we saw here. So uh, just if you want to model something, uh, one way to do it, one nice way to do it, is just categorize it, meaning try to model it with terms and concepts from category theory. Then add a semantic to it, meaning map out of it with the functor to a more concrete category where you can actually perform some computation. And then hopefully you have fun. Yeah, uh, so thanks you all. Uh,